When somebody asks me about it, here's the response I usually give them. I put it on the screen if you'd like to snap a picture of it. It'll let you relax, I think, a little bit. Here's what I say. When I read the Bible, I see one trumpet sound. And Jesus coming on the clouds like he promised he would do. When he, he said, I'll come back exactly the way that I went up. See, I don't worry about how things will roll out until then. Honestly, I pray for God to save his last millions in the next five minutes and crack the clouds on the clock striking the sixth. Come, Lord Jesus. Anybody else? Come, Lord Jesus, come. But one of the uh, interesting questions about the end of time, and it's going to come up in our passage today, is what is God going to do with the blood race of the Jewish nation. You know, a lot of the disagreements about how all that's going to unfold has to do with God's treatment of the folks who are born Jewish. And I've got a response to that. It's that that also is not clear, but it's obvious that he has his eye on them all the time. So it would not surprise me if there's a special move toward Jesus by the Jewish people close to the time of Christ's return. See, God doesn't love the Jewish folks more than he loves you Gentiles, you bacon-eating Gentiles. See, Jesus' blood was a love splattered for all, equally for all. But I want you to think about the Jewish folks like that firstborn older sibling. Anybody live in a family that the firstborn kind of has a special look on them? That's pretty common in families of origin, and in this case, you know, it's the rebellious older brother, and we're the kind of the young, sometimes obedient, adopted child. The first one is out wandering around being rebellious, but God has an eye on him even though he's a rebel. There's a special relationship there. I want you to think of John, the book of John, the, the description of, or Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 15, the description of uh, the father looking out for the prodigal son, scanning, having a special relationship for that rebellious son. Personally, I've seen Jewish, Jewish folks become what we call messianic Jews, the completed Jew, the, the person born into the Jewish race and then becomes a Christ follower. That is an incredibly beautiful thing if you've never been a part of that. It stirs something deep within my soul. I would ask you, what stirs your soul? That's one thing that gets me. All image bearers of God are equal in the Father's eyes, but there's something special there. And if you're feeling something a little bit funny inside your soul right now, you're getting on where we're headed here this morning because our sin nature can sense that little special relationship there. So the adopted one, us, we get jealous. In sin, follow with me here. Human self-centeredness hates that God set, it, set his eyes on any choosing. That's why people hate Reformed theology. They hate the presentation that, of Romans 9 that John gave recently. It is, we hate the idea that God has set his eye on choosing and raising his Messiah through a particular race of people. And historically, that has come out sometimes in small ways of racism. And sometimes it comes out in big ways, like the Holocaust the slaughters in Philadelphia, or rockets flying into Israel from Hezbollah. Why else would a human race abuse and murder a particular people so much? It must be simple, wicked selfishness. And I think sometimes we think, yeah, all those evil people. And I always tell people, until you recognize that you have the same heart that has killed millions, you may have struggled to be saved. And if you are saved, you will struggle to be a great worshiper because you don't know how much sin the blood of Christ has had to cleanse. This whole question must be simple, wicked selfishness. See, the selfish world has always thought God didn't have the right to choose them as a conduit. He didn't have the right to choose who he wants to choose. From Romans 9, he didn't have the right to show mercy on whom he would show mercy. Mercy, And we need to be careful telling God what he has or has not the right to do. We would say he 
uh, would set on them and, and that they would not even have the right to make the claim. There's something inside all of us that hates them because we all carry that selfish wickedness. But listen closely. There's something in our new creation self. Listen close. There's something in the new creation that should love them, that should develop a special love for them as God loves them. But sometimes that's difficult because the Jewish people have a history of rejecting the very God that chose them, yes? And they can be quite unlovable on occasion. We have to remember their hearts were affected by sinful rebellion just as much as ours. And in the New Covenant, God says that any person who rejects Jesus Christ as king of all, that person is not with him. No matter what race you were born into, no matter what socioeconomic group you were born into, no matter what your status is, lest you be in Christ, you are not with God. And the honest fact is that most Jews loudly reject Jesus as the Messiah. Some poor Jewish folk, fellow had a, the opportunity to sit with me one time for a little while. It was an inopportunity for him, I probably, but at some point in that conversation, as I shared the gospel with him, he said, you mean to tell me that me, one of God's chosen own, has to accept your Jesus to see eternal life? And I said, I'm not telling you anything. It was a fellow Jew that said that. That is a claim of Christ that you're going to have to deal with. My recommendation is that you ask God by the power of his spirit to reveal to you if that's true or not. But it was an affront to him that I would say such a thing. So once again, the vast majority of Jewish folks are rejecting the God who chose them. And this must break God's heart. And if you were here for John's rendition of chapter 9, it breaks Paul's heart as well. He went so far to say that his heart is so broken over that, that he would give up his salvation, that he would resign himself to hell if but his, all of his people would be saved. Do you love your neighbor enough? Do you love your people enough to even begin to fathom that, let alone say it? I find that saying of Paul incredibly convicting if I'm considering whether I love my neighbor or not. Because he was not extending any hyperbole. He was not making some kind of metaphorical, exaggerated point. He was saying, I would make this exchange because I love my people. Paul was completely sold out to Jesus, but he loved his folks as rebellious as they could be. And at the end of Chapter 10, he said this, but of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people as we move into chapter 11, verse 1. And he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? And he says, by no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to the prophet Elijah? I have kept, my, kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Just to get a little personal with you here for a second, I'm going to give you this point. We are not alone. Elijah just cried out about feeling alone there. And I, I just want to say this to you. We are not alone. There is always a remnant. Kelly and I uh, visited Israel, and uh, this was one of the most poignant moments for me as I stood in this spot that you can see in this picture right here. This is on top of Mount Carmel where Elijah defeated the Baal prophets, and, and I just want you to see out over the, that that mountain looks out over the, the valley called Armageddon. That's the valley of Jezreel where all of, all of the visuals of Revelation, however you think Revelation plays out, that's the valley of Armageddon. 
And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah uh, has taken on his own people who have been rebellious against God. They had torn down all of the proper altars to God and built uh, altars to Baal. Ahab and Jezebel were like the modern-day Sopranos or the, or the modern-day Isis, but they were the own, their own people, so it would be like, these are our own people have turned to such wickedness, and he kills the Baal prophets in this spot on Mount Carmel, slaughters them, kind of like the Old Testament version of the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. And what happens? Jezebel puts a contract out on Elijah. She has all the power of the nation. She is with her weak little husband Ahab ruling. And if you've ever had a satanic woman trying to kill you, what would you try to do? do you, what would any of you that have any sense do? Well, we as Americans, we would run to the run, gun range, right? We would, we would run and... and and pack up our Glocks and start practicing, or we would uh, go to judo class and start doing some self-defense course. No, we, nobody's going to defeat us. We're great Americans. We'd get ready to fight. Well, that's not what Elijah did. He did what anybody with any sense would do if that level of satanic woman tried to kill you. What'd he do? He ran straight across that valley. He ran all the way across that valley to another mountain on the other side of that valley. And he became, listen to this, he just had all the power of God. He just called down fire from heaven and burned up an altar that had been soaked in water. He just defeated all the Baal prophets when he was outnumbered significantly. Everything was against him. He'd seen the authority and the power of God all over him. And he, in the moment that he feels like he cannot defeat Jezebel, the power of the cross is all of a sudden less than the power of Satan and he became scared, ran, and fell into depression. If you've ever felt depression, you and Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, have something in common. Have you felt that? If you felt like God left you, those are his cries. Well, God in his sovereignty and love draws close to Elijah as he's feeling this way. And Paul refers to it in this passage in Romans 11. He says, Elijah, don't forget, I never will forsake you. I never will leave you alone. Just over the hill, there are 7,000 faithful Jewish folks who have not bowed to Baal. I have prepared them for this moment. And listen to this, crazy cannot touch you. You should feel some warmth come over you right now. Like, as I'm feeling like this world of darkness is pressing in and is about to kill me, at any moment in your life, God speaks over you and says, crazy cannot get you. Crazy cannot touch you. We cannot always see what God is doing in the midst of craziness, but he reminds us here that he's always doing something. And he has prepared others to take care of us. Elijah has made a major mistake here. He, had, he has removed himself from community. And if you've ever become depressed and removed yourself from community, you might be lucky that God would show up and remind you that the remnant is still just over the hill. But he would ask you to walk over the hill. Walk over the hill to his people that I have prepared for you. We've seen it this last four or five weeks as the body has flocked to serve us, community. Uh, Kel and I can't express enough our thanks to all of you for reminding us as, we, it was, as it felt like the dark was closing in. Some depression came. There were nights, and there's still nights, that we wonder where he's gone as we try to attain some form of physical health. But just be reminded, if you give your life to Christ, listen to me. If you give your life to Christ and you are all in, you will suffer loss in doing so. There is no such thing as becoming a Christ follower that is interested in carrying out his ultimate purposes and plans on, in this broken earth that can do so without loss. 
That is why people flock from church to church to church and they flock from different places and they run all the time like Elijah because they have forgotten that Jesus promised us that if we do things the way he is asking to do, there will be loss. But he will always reveal his glory by taking care of you in the long run. <coughs> in, in Romans 8, let's make it read me a bottle of water. In Romans 8, it is obvious that God will um, take care of those who are, who are doing well with his church plants. He says, when you, when you do things on my behalf and the dark comes to press in on you, be reminded that all that happens while that darkness is pressing in will turn to good. I will turn it to good to reveal my glory. See, Elijah went through it. Paul went through it. Ultimately, Jesus went through it, right? He gets some commands from the Father, and he goes and he's obedient to the Father. How well did that turn out for him in a human scale? And so we would expect that we would give ourselves completely to the Father and that somehow we would escape what Jesus says was not allowed to escape. We're lucky we don't get a cross. <coughs> But just as God reminded them that he was taking care of them, even though they could not see it, he does the same for you and me. This promise to Elijah is for you today. He never leaves us, he never forsakes us. He sends us his people. Verse seven. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking? The elect obtained it, you? But the rest were hardened? As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. Anybody received that gift? Eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear. Down to this very day, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The reality of this world is that sometimes we darken our own hearts Sometimes God, listen to this, in his sovereignty darkens the hearts of men for his purposes. And you say, well, I don't like that God. A very common human response to that statement, I don't like that God. Well, let me prophetically give you the best counsel you will ever hear in this moment. God has profound love for you. Everybody in this room, hear my voice. God has profound love for you, displayed at the cross of Calvary. Can you agree? Can you in this moment agree? God has incredible love for me, displayed on a cross of Calvary. No one has ever loved me anywhere close to that degree, but he is vastly more for him and his story and his glory than he is for yours. See, if you can kind of get your mind around that, if you can receive that today, if you can begin to uh, have that seep into your soul, your life in God will begin to soar, to soar. God has incredible love for you. A bloody cross testifies. Amen? Amen? It screams, I love you. There's no soft peddling of love coming off that bloody cross. And in chapter 8, we learn that all things in your life will be turned to good for the glory of the kingdom. But that love for you never supersedes, never supplants his plan to reveal his glory in the coming ages. That would not be preached very many places this weekend. What that says is that God is vastly for God. And you say, well, that sounds arrogant. And if you think that sounds arrogant, you don't understand the nature and character of God. His glory deserves, his glory deserves that. God is not responsible for our darkness. Would you, say, would you agree with me that we self-inflict most of it? Some of it comes in from the outside. Some of you have experienced abuse from the outside. And that is not darkness that you ask for. But God is responsible for how much light we can see in the midst of of us wandering around blind and lost. 
See, there was a remnant for Elijah, a revealing of light into his depression. Listen to me, if you're struggling to worship today, I need you to, to process this. If you have had full light revealed at any moment in your life, I mean, you've seen the glory of Jesus. And if you're redeemed in this room, if you come and take this communion today, you have fully seen his light at some point in your life. You cannot claim salvation and not say, God, God has never pierced the darkness with me. I've never gotten out of my, my darkness. I, I, I just haven't ever felt that. No, then you probably are not saved. If you come take this communion today, you have seen his light. He has pierced your darkness. And if you have had that light revealed, you should fall on the floor, maybe like right now, in admiration and appreciation because there was nothing about you that was good or neat that God let you see that. That's the definition of grace. Pure mercy and grace. And let me just say this. If you still feel dark but saw that at one time, plead with God to re-pierce your soul this morning with his light. Verse 11. That's where our Jewish folks are. Their nation has had light revealed to it. And yet, Paul says, so I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. There was a plan. So as to make Israel jealous. Even Israel's hardening had a purpose. It was to open the door so you clowns here in Arnold, you Gentile bacon-eating clowns in 2019 could be saved. And in God's economy, it gets even better. He uses that plan to drive the new Jewish nation back to him. A Jewish person would say, oh my gosh, God is so he's revealing his light. He's saving folks from a meth capital that they actually do eat pork. And come on. I feel jealous. It feels like he's turned away. That when it, when it, you understand that when a, a Jewish person receives Christ in this day, they say, oh my gosh, I've got to get together with the people who have seen the light. I, I feel a jealousy for them. The God that I know is mine has set his light somewhere else. I've got to run to that God. That's hard stuff. But it's kind of fun because that turns into win upon win upon win. You get a nice benefit out of that, yes? God turned his eye to you, but now we are to be such a light back into the world that the Jewish folks would go, yes, it is Jesus. We don't have anything like what those folks have. Verse 12, now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, How much more will their full inclusion mean? More win-win. If we dig deep enough into God's plans, there are always multiple wins. He's shining his glory in multiple ways. We don't like the way he does it. I'm sure the Jewish nation would go, whoa, wait a minute. You had to harden our hearts and take it somewhere else before we could say, yes. He's probably done that to you. Oh my goodness, look at that person thriving in Christ. I, I need to talk to them. I don't know what they got going on, but I want to know what they have. Yes? We've got to let it play out long term. Don't look at today and think that's the end of the plan. You've got to look at it long term. Some heartache, but wins. Wins. And at the end of the day, aren't salvation wins what matter? Look at this screen. Here's your life. Here's what it should be. That it's had a deep relationship with God, and you add to that deep relationship with each other. Plus, salvation wins. You know what that equals? That equals a sensing of eternity. See, if you're caught up in just this moment right now, it's because there's not a deep, rela- deep relationship. You might have a relationship with God, but it's not a deep relationship with God. And if you're caught up in just this moment, there's probably not a deep relationship with others. And you may not be inter- interested in salvation wins at all. But when those things start tacking together, you will get this sensing of eternity that nothing can touch you. Nothing can touch you. So a soul-searching question that I would add to that is this. How much of your days are about that? 
How much of your days are about a deep relationship with God? How much of your days are about a deep relationship with each other? And how much of your days are about salvation wins? If you would like to have God set into you an untouchable sense of eternity, that is where your heart and soul must turn. Let us help you do that. Because if you had a Jewish friend, I don't know if any of you have Jewish friends, if you had a Jewish friend who is arrogant as can be, like my friend who said, what do you mean to tell me that I must take your Jesus? What do you mean to tell me a person chosen by God? If you had that friend, would they be provoked to jealousy because of your amazing relationship with Christ? Your amazing long-term view of eternity that nothing in the short term can touch you? Or would they just be confused? Paul's about to describe two illustrations about how natural it would be for Jews to come to Christ. Listen to these. Verse 13 said, Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered his first fruits, dough offered to the J Jewish nation is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root to Abraham and then to Jesus is holy, so are the branches. So if you're a little confused there, the root there is Abraham. God set himself into Abraham so that Jesus would come and be the root of all things. And these branches here that he is talking about are faithful Jews who have received Christ by faith alone. So in Paul's context, he would say any Jew who can claim health has now met Christ. And so for the rest of the tree, he was surrounded by this entire nation of people rebelling against God's prophecy about Christ and receiving Christ. There's many uh, lost natural born Jews there. It would be natural for them to become holy because their father, Abraham, was holy. He was, declared, he was declared righteous by faith. He didn't know the name Jesus, but it was faith in Jesus. Because Jesus was coming through that line that he was being promised. But they must, listen, Paul would say they must have Christ. A real discouraging Barner report just came out and a bunch of us in Acts 29 are trying to pick this thing apart a little bit right now that says that almost 80% of millennials say that um, evangelism is wrong. That it's just downright wrong to try to take somebody in a faith that they have and tell them that they must have Jesus, right? This, this chapter is about evangelism, right? I mean, like, Paul wants to see his people saved. And we should want to see all lost people saved. And... Um, our younger generations are saying that uh, there should be no evangelism. But as this illustration continues, we redeemed Gentiles now come into the picture as uh, grafted wild olive branches that are healthy and fruitful. And the point is this, if God can graft in a wild branch and make it uh, fruitful, you and me, Right? If you're a believer in this room, you've been filled with God's Spirit, make it healthy and fruitful to reveal His glory. How much more glory would there be as a natural branch who has been in rebellion to come? Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off, like those that are rejecting sometimes just get broken off, you are no longer in the tree. Although a wild olive shoot we're grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Now, most of you right now would expect me to have a whiteboard up here, right? Start drawing three trees with this crazy waterfall. And if you've never experienced that here, you haven't experienced City on a Hill because we do everything here by saying that everything is about this waterfall of grace that God brings. But let's move on. Jews are the natural branches in those trees. We are the wild ones, but it's the same tree. If you've ever been taught in some dispensational view that they're separate trees, <laughs> you've been taught, taught heresy, honestly. The same tree. C.S. Lewis said this, in every sense, the converted Jew is the only normal human being in the world. Everyone else is, from one point of view, a special case dealt with under emergency conditions. It's classic, C.S. Lewis. 
So what does this mean for you Gentiles, right? You're sitting here, give me something to sink my teeth into. Well, here you go. It means we Gentiles, and he's about to address this, have been graced with Jesus, but we should not be arrogant. Because he just directly says that. To you Gentiles, do not be arrogant. Verse 18, if you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Oh, a bunch of people just go, oh, that's not my God. Yes, it is. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, though, but fear. Keep that fear you had on the day of your salvation. Keep that look at God's glory. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. The fact that we were grafted into a tree that we were not originally intended for should humble us. Especially towards Jewish folks. Because I'll be honest with you, God, will, like he does with all human beings, especially with them, will do what he wants to do. He is God. And just like he set them aside for a time, like in the Old Testament, and now he may do that with us as well. If, I've always said this about the American church. He may just set you completely aside and go do all his work in revealing his glory elsewhere. But we are running the risk right now of being so impotent that God would just say, I thought it was you. And move and reveal his glory in very large ways other places. Verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial, partial hardening, not a full hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Ever, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Ever wonder why, uh, why uh, sweeping salvation with the Jews has not happened and Christ has not returned? Well, that just was a pretty good hit right there. Does it feel, do you like we have the fullness of the Gentiles happening? Is that what you sense around you? That there's a fullness of Christ in the Gentiles? It's not a rhetorical question. Yes or no? No. Heck no. The Gentile culture is completely whack, honestly. Verse 26. And in this way, all of Israel will be saved. He'll collect that whole tree. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There is no salvation for the Jews outside of Christ. But once again, it does appear there that God, God has this love, great loving attention to his natural branches. In the glories of the cross. Don't hear some kind of universalism up here. That would be heresy. The cross is where he takes away sins for the natural branches. The cross is where he takes away sins for us wild olive branch roots. Did you know you were a wild olive branch root? Yeah, you kind of, you know, I don't know. This group doesn't look very wild. That's us. I have no de uh, idea of the details of how God will set some special attention on the Jewish nation as we near Jesus' return, but it is obvious it's going to happen. Verse 28, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Oh my goodness. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience to the, olive, to the wild olive shoots, the natural branches of their disobedience, they too have been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. That's one of Paul's like 24 sentence run on situations. He flunked my grammar class. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And be careful with that sentence right there. It's good news. Not all people saved, but all types of people saved. Here's what we know. There will be a great pouring out of God's mercy in the future. The Gentile folks will have a great uptick in the proclamation of the gospel. Are you, are you feeling a wave in your soul that you should be a part of that? A wave in your soul that we would be a part of this, of this great proclamation of the gospel. And that then there is some kind of massive 
restoration in store for the Jews. Can you picture in your mind, I don't know how end times are going to play out. I don't pretend to know all those prophecies exactly. But can you picture in your mind that you are alive as God begins to have this outpouring of grace and mercy on the Jewish nation? And you can feel and sense it happening. You should visit Israel sometime, and when you're there, we'll set you up with church planters there that are, would tell you they start to feel that wave happening once in a while. One of them is an American Jew married to a Levite priest. Messianic Jew. That's fun, man. That's fun hanging out with those guys. They, they, put, they put the little yarmulke on my head, made me Jewish so I could go down to the cornerstone of the, of the temple. And you can't help but just start bawling when you start to see all that coming together. When you look on Samuel, our our man, our Levite priest, this, this natural branch in his completeness as a pastor in a church plan of Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem under the threat of death daily by the Orthodox Jews. It is a beautiful, incredible thing. So let's just go deep in our hearts because the history of the Gentile is to be anti-Semite. Yes? That's our history. It's to live out our anti-Semitism by not sharing the gospel with the Jews. How horrific is that? How much, I mean, there's all kinds of ways the church needs to repent. There's one of them, right? Let us be repentant in that. Let us pray for the salvation of our Jewish brethren. May not, not be so here. Because you know what? Some group of Gentile believers will reject that sin and follow the story of God bringing the gospel back to the Jewish nation in its fullness with the cross of Calvary as its centerpiece. Yes? Why not us? Why not us? Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for making a um, difficult writing for Paul to come to life to us. Thank you. Um, that we would sit here uh, with kind of a big picture view of what your story entails, that it's not just a microcosm of our small little problems here that we're living in, but with you, we've been invited to this big story. We've been invited to the, to the incredible God narrative of the salvation of the world that culminates in the return of Jesus Christ. And, and we uh, submit ourselves that you are, the, you are the one who will decide how all that plays out we thank you for our invitation to be a part of it. We thank you for our invitation that we get to, in the midst of having difficult times like Elijah and like Paul and like Jesus, be a part of the restoration of all things. Help us to set our eyes on a much bigger picture than the small things that bother us on a daily basis. May we turn those quickly over to you. May we turn our small little fights with each other over to you quickly so that they don't get in the way of us getting to experience you revealing your glory all over this earth. And then make us aware. I ask that you give every person in this room a natural branch relative that they know, that they can reach out and touch. I also ask you to give them a natural branch that has rejected Christ, that is angry toward the thought of Christ, so that they might be able to share the gospel and possibly have the opportunity to lead someone of the Jewish faith to a complete Jewish faith in Christ Jesus. There is nothing better. It is so much fun. We thank you that you invite us to do such a thing. That the wild offshoots get to invite the natural branches home. Thank you, God. Thank you for Paul's heart who would say, um, I would give up my eternity in heaven and take an eternity in hell if but my brethren would receive the glories of Jesus. May we have a heart similar that we would love our neighbor that we cannot stand them going to hell. And as chapter 10 would say, how would they know if they're not preached to? How would they know if we don't tell them the gospel? And that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Amen.